In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, and that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins, for the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. In the second Sunday of Advent, the Church puts before us the figure of John the Baptist. We read in today's Gospel from the Gospel of Luke, The Word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the desert. John went throughout the whole region of the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As we know, Lord, Advent is a penitential season a season in which we look to fight against our sinfulness, to recognize the different ways in which we sin, and fight to make up for it and to overcome it. And it's a wonderful way of preparing for you to come, Lord, as our Redeemer, as our Savior. We need you to save us from our sins. John's preaching was backed up by his penitential life. He's not just telling others to repent, not just telling others to overcome their fallen human nature, but he was doing it. In the Gospel of Matthew, we have a description of his attire and his diet. It's almost like if a celebrity magazine were to do an interview or an article about some celebrity. What does this guy eat and how does he dress? What's his exercise routine? we would find something like this from the Gospel of Matthew. Now John himself wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Now of those things, I think only the wild honey sounds appetizing to me. Certainly not the locusts. The camel's hair was itchy. It was a penitential garment. I suppose the leather belt I could I could put up with. But we see here that John isn't just talking about repentance. He's finding ways to do penance for himself and for others. Advent, Lord, as this penitential season, at times can just be one string of Christmas parties after another. And as opposed to doing any sort of penance to prepare for you, rather I stuff myself with cookies and candy canes and whatever other treats are being bandied about office parties or other parties. Lord, help me not to forget that this is a time of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The more I find some little self-denial, some little way of mortifying myself, the more I prepare myself well for the coming of my Redeemer, for the coming of my Savior. John went throughout the whole region of the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying out in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The winding road shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Lord, in John's description of the difference you're going to make in my life, the difference you're going to make in the world, we find powerful images of change, powerful images of a kind of radical transformation. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The winding roads shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Imagine experiencing this, that you go for some hike to your favorite mountain, and and you get there, and it's gone. There's no mountain there. What a shock. What a tremendous change. Something drastic must have happened there, that a mountain or a hill be made low. Or you go to some valley, and or some gorge, and... It's not there anymore. It's just a tranquil plain. Some rolling hills in place of that steep valley or that ravine. 
tremendous images of change of God's power. And of course, Scripture always has a spiritual and moral sense that these changes that John the Baptist describes, these ecological, cosmological changes, are changes that our Lord wants to bring about in your soul, in my soul. Hills made low, valleys filled, wanding roads made straight. But I have to believe this is possible. In order, Lord, to have you work miracles in my soul, I have to believe it's possible and I have to want it. I have to be on board. There's a book that's been popular in recent years. It's called Mindset by a psychologist, or maybe she's a psychiatrist, one of those um, lady named Carol Dweck. And it's a helpful book. It, It basically makes the point that If people don't think they can change and grow, then they won't. And if they do think that they can change and grow, then they tend to improve in things that they're they're working on, that they're interested in improving. And it makes sense, right? If I think, well, I'll never get better at this because I'm bad in this way. Well, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy, prophecy of doom, (laughs) Because if I think I'll never get better at this because that's the way I am, well, then I'll never try to get better and I'll never look for help to get better. I'll just ignore that aspect of growth, that aspect of my life. Whereas if I think, well, I might not be good at this now. I might not be great at this particular aspect of life or this particular skill. But I think with practice and with some wisdom and some help from others, sure, I can make progress. And that second attitude, the belief in our ability to improve, actually leads to improvement because we'll we'll work on things and we'll look for ways to get better and we'll look for the help that we need. St. Josemaria makes a similar point in the way. He says, don't say, that's just the way I am. That's my character. It's your lack of character. Estovir, be a man. Be a man, be a woman, and men and women, human beings, are capable of improvement. Lord, especially with your help. And the danger, Lord, of self-limiting beliefs is that implicitly they're also God-limiting beliefs. If I say and really believe that I can't improve in some virtue, or I can't make any progress in overcoming some vice, I'm also saying that I don't really think that God can help me with this problem. I really don't think that God can help me grow in this or that way. Right? If I can't improve, then implicitly we're saying I can't be improved, right? And no one no one can help me. And so those self-limiting beliefs, right? I'm just this way, this will never get better, end up being God-limiting beliefs. God counts on our trust in his power to help us. In order to help us, God counts on our faith in his power and our own desires to change. And so we have to look out for those self-limiting beliefs, the, the idea that, no, this hill can never be lowered, or this valley will never be filled, or this crooked path will never be made straight. As the angel Gabriel told Our Lady, right, with God, all things are possible. All things are possible with God. A virgin mother, an old lady well into her old age, becoming a mother, St. Elizabeth, God becoming man. All things are possible with God. Lord, help me overcome any sort of lack of confidence I have in you, grounded in experience of my own weakness or my own failures. Lord, help me to overcome any self-limiting beliefs that are also perhaps God-limiting beliefs that handcuff you. We see an example of this in the um, Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus goes to Nazareth and they don't believe in him because they know him so well. And the Gospel says, and he did not perform many miracles there because of their unbelief. So there's something about 
belief that unlocks God's power, unlocks miracles, not just physical miracles, but perhaps more importantly, in our case, spiritual and moral miracles, improving some relationship that we thought was beyond repair, overcoming some vice or addiction that we thought we would never get traction on, building some habit that we thought was beyond our natural capacity, learning how to pray better after years of scuffling along and half-heartedly trying to pray. All these are miracles in our interior life, Lord, that perhaps you want to bring about if I had more confidence in you, if I took more responsibility for it, right? If I were more of a mature man or woman who says, yeah, I, I can learn this and uh, I'll find someone to help me, some spiritual direction or look for a good book and ask God for help, let his grace in there between his grace and some knowledge and my good and my goodwill and my persistent effort, I can make progress. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. Images, Lord, of my soul and my soul's relationship with you. Our soul is like a valley, an empty space that needs to be filled by God, that needs to be filled with faith, hope, and love. And sometimes in life we can feel a kind of semi-permanent dissatisfaction with things. The things and the relationships that used to give us a lot of joy, a lot of interest, a lot of drive, might leave us flat. They might no longer excite us or satisfy us in the way that they used to. And our life at times can be marked by a kind of vague longing a sneaky loneliness in the background, a sense of dissatisfaction. And spiritually, that's a very important thing to uncover, to look at. Blaise Pascal says, There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator, made known through Jesus Christ. Pascal is making this point that our heart is the valley that needs to be filled by God in Jesus Christ. There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man, which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator, made known through Jesus Christ. So Lord, my times of longing or those insights I get into my dissatisfaction, it's not that I, it's not that I stop loving people or stop caring but but there's a certain forlornness or longing that creeps into our life at times and sometimes it's it's very dominant and and evident and instead of running to fill ourselves up with things that will not satisfy distraction or some form of sin food exercise All these things that are available for us to just run into and run away from this longing for God. Instead of doing that, to recognize, no, I need to feed my soul with God. And perhaps, above all, I need to be patient with this longing. God bides his time in coming to us. He wants us to need him. He wants us to hunger for him. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? And our Lord keeps us in this situation to help us grow that desire for Him, to grow in that need for Him. And that's a good thing. It's a hard thing to do, but... It's a good thing, because unless we really know that we need God, we won't meet God. Only when we really need God will we really meet God. Especially Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ comes as Savior, as Redeemer, as someone we need to pull us out of this pit of sin, of self-centeredness, the fallenness of the world, the fallenness of our own nature. 
Lord Jesus, only when I really need you, when I really thirst for your salvation, for your help, will I really meet you. And so help me to be patient with those moments of frustration, dissatisfaction, longing, loneliness, and keep me, Lord, from filling up on the wrong things. Keep me from filling up on spiritual junk food, which we know (laughs) in the physical life, if we fill up with junk food, well, we're not going to feel better. It's going to be bad for our health. It's going to be bad for our mood. It's bad for everything. It's only a temporary fix. And so if we fill our lives up with spiritual junk food, right, lower distractions, lower motives, lower escapes from our problems, from those valleys or hills that are bothering us, well, it's not going to work. It's not going to, it's not going to help. Lord, help me to be more discriminating, more refined in what I look for to fill that vacuum in my heart. Help me to look for you. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? This idea of being discriminating with what we eat reminds me of my my sister's dog. My older sister has a dog, which is a shipu, a combination of a shih tzu and a poodle. And um, personally, I really don't like this dog because she comes off as extremely stuck up. And so maybe she'll let you pet her, but if you go to touch her face, to pet her around the face or the head, she kind of tilts her head away from you in a kind of condescending disgust, like, oh, please don't touch me, you peasant. (laughs) And my sister really loves this dog, and she should. It's a good good dog, and they have a special bond. But... um, she pampers it. And so this dog is very, very discriminating about what it eats. It only eats really high quality food and and high quality treats, etc. And I'll never forget one time the this dog was visiting my parents' house and my parents at that time had just your garden variety black lab, a dog named Loco. Loco the dog. So my mom was there with these dogs and she said, oh, let's give the dogs a treat. And so she pulled out some typical biscuit that they used to give Loco. And so she she put, she put gives them to both dogs. And of course, Loco is just this animal and gobbles up that treat, all excited. And uh, my sister's dog, Marley, is her name. She's still with us, actually. <laughs> my sister's dog kind of sniffs at the treat the biscuit or whatever it was and then kind of holds her head up and just walks away doesn't even taste it or take a little nibble and of course at that point loco swoops in and gobbles up her treat (laughs) as well as far as dogs go right i'd rather be uh, loco than marley but that's not the point the point is that in our soul we need to be a little bit more like that shipu, right? That that discriminating, refined dog that really has no time for cheap snacks, right? Has no time for stuff that isn't the best. But we need to give our souls the best. Only God can fill this valley that I have in my heart. Only God can satisfy this deep longing that at times I will feel. Only when we really need God will we truly meet God. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. From Psalm 42. Lord, if it's true that I need you to fill the valley that is my heart, that is myself, And so we say, come, Lord Jesus, help me to meet you in Advent, meet you in Christmas in a new way, in a deeper way. Well, Lord, it's also true that I need you to lower the hills. The great hill in my life, Lord, is my love for myself. My overinflated 
self-esteem, my obsessive self-regard, my attachment to my opinions, to my will, to my way, my tendency to make myself the center of my existential universe, thinking about myself, planning things in terms of my own advantage, worrying too much about my reputation, or my health, or my pleasure, or how my day's going, whatever, my mood. Lord, this is a great hill that needs to be lowered. The hill of my pride, the hill of my self-centeredness. And there too, Lord, I need to believe that you can do this, and I need to want it. When Jesus performs miracles in the gospel, He does it most times, the majority of times, to people who not only believe that he can do it, but people who really want it. And they come great distances with their lameness or with their blindness or being possessed or carried by others who really want him to help. And they get in front of our Lord and they say things like, Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus, heal my daughter. She's at the point of death. They come to him and they express not just their faith that he can do something, but their desire. And at times, Lord, I don't have this desire to be humble, to help you raise that hill of my self-esteem, of my self-reliance, So that perhaps I can realize that, oh, there's a valley under that hill. And it needs to be filled by God. I filled the valley of longing for God, of having love for God with myself. Things that I can get, things that I can control, things that I can do. And the valley was filled and now it's become this nasty mountain of self-regard, of self-reliance, of self-control, of self-indulgence. And so before I can become a valley that our Lord fills with himself, or before I can uncover the valley that's always there to be filled by God, perhaps first I need to remove the hill, the hill of the illusion of having a life that runs without God, that runs on human motives, that runs around basically pride. But like those people in the gospel, Lord, I have to want this. I have to recognize it. I have to ask for it and believe not just that you can do it, that you can help me overcome my pride to be truly humble, truly dependent on you. But I have to also want it. I want it badly to travel, to come to our Lord and present him with my case. A voice of one crying out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The winding road shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Incredible line from the Psalms. Speaking directly to God, say to my soul, I am your salvation. Tell me that you love me. Tell me that you saved me. Lord, help me to want this salvation. Lord, help me to need this salvation. Lord, help me to overcome what we call that fixed mindset, that idea that even with your help, this or that thing can improve, can't get better. Help me to overcome, Lord, those self-limiting beliefs that also handcuff you. Help my soul Lord, not be another Nazareth. Help my soul and my life not be a place where you can't perform any great works, any miracles, because of my lack of belief. Or perhaps instead because of my lack of desire that I don't come to you needy. Help me to need you, Lord, so that I can truly meet you. And to look, to look for points of conversion, whether they're valleys or they're hills, what are the things in my life that I really need to work on? 
What are the bigger obstacles to loving the people in my life, to serving the people in my life? What are the bigger obstacles to my prayer life? Where's the virtue or the attitude that I really think that I'm incapable of? Those are the ones I think at times, those are the ones to just tackle head on. I'm going to work on the hardest thing in my life in a really positive way with faith in God and with a sense that, eh, this might take time, but I'm going to keep at it. Keep finding ways to improve little things, little resolutions to make that might help this situation or help that relationship. And to do it all with this confidence in God. That he can fill valleys and he can lower mountains. We go to Our Lady in these weeks of Advent. So easy to turn our mind and our heart to her especially in these days of the Novena of the Immaculate Conception before December 8th. It's so easy for us to turn our eyes to her. And what was she? Well, she was a valley that let herself be filled by God. The Lord has regarded the lowliness of his handmaid, as she describes herself. In her humility, she creates a space for God. She becomes a vessel for God. And so we ask her, help us too to imitate your humility, to be okay being empty, carving out, carving out room in our heart, even if it feels like loneliness or dissatisfaction at times, carving out room in our heart so that God can fill it. Our Lady, our Mother, Mother of the Unborn, Mother of the Unborn, Lord Jesus Christ, pray for us. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations which you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect, my Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.